So, um, welcome to uh, Service UK's first podcast. Um, we're not sure what to call it yet, but I think it's going to be called um, Blood, Sweat and Deers. Um, we did put it out to our Instagram followers and ask them to give us a few names. Most of them I can't repeat, <laughs> repeat on here, Andrew. But um, so the reason this came about was um, several people had suggested it and we kind of poo-pooed it. And then, you know, we're locked down yet again. Um, I'm really missing being out in the woods and engaging with my clients and the guys that help me and, and, and generally seeing people in the shooting shows. So it's just a way of getting and keeping in contact. And um, I haven't seen you for a good while, Andrew. You would normally be over culling with us in Hampshire at this time of the year, so we're not going to do this. Um, how I'm managing that is um, the local lads to the estates that we manage are going out and just doing a dripping tap on the uh, on the docal. Um, so I asked you because you're a, a silverback of the industry, as you once described me, so I'm throwing that back at you. Um, so welcome, and um, it's nice to see you. How you been keeping? I've been keeping well. I should add that uh, in choosing me, I've got to know that my name is Venable, so I'm right at the end of your address book. You must have been through most of <laughs> No, no, before. you were number one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's quite nice, actually, because I... Um, I have been kicking around this industry for quite a while. And I started yeah. after kind of Dan, um, my son who's involved with Service UK and is the creative element of our business, said, mm-hmm. right, let's do it. Write a list of who you think. And um, it was incredible who I did actually know um, mm-hmm. and regularly speak to. Um, I could almost say globally, if you count the lads in New Zealand, uh, where we could do a podcast and have a chat about stuff, you know what I mean, that people yeah. may find yeah. interesting or, you know, it's just a catch up really. But um, yeah, so th- that was why we came about with it. And there's, you know, we're probably very late coming to the table with podcasts, but, well, you know, it's, we'll see how it goes. I, I have a, enjoy having a chat with um, most people. And I had a guy a few weeks back actually asked me to, uh, uh, a keeper from over in Norfolk um, and he asked me to do a podcast with him and we did an hour and I thoroughly enjoyed it and that was kind of the the uh, the energy behind this that got me doing it so um, so you've been keeping well for the people who, who don't know you and there can't be many in the world um, Andrew Venables WMS tra- um, firearms training tell us a bit about what you do Andrew um what we do is help people be better. We, we, we help people make the shot um, with various different sort of levels to what we do. We, we provide private individuals with uh, training, with continuous professional development, you know, material, if you like. Uh, we've provided all sorts of things, maritime firearms training competency for the security industry. Uh, I've trained zoos and wildlife parks in uh, what they call, uh, well, firearms large animal response i suppose they call it a little bit like the police i've done a lot of training with the police um, forces over the years what they call large mammal destruction because you can't say kill or death it's funny um, you should say that andrew because um the, the the guy that works at the slaughterhouse um where i put carcasses into um uh, the the local butchers he's one of the guys contracted to um if there's a problem on the zoos, go in and do a humane dispatch. And um, when we went into this first lockdown, there was issue, this issue where they couldn't perhaps afford to feed all these animals without any income from the public. And yeah. so he was on an alert that you may have to come in and destroy some of them. Thankfully, mm-hmm. they got a, um, a grant uh, and they've mm-hmm. all survived in the current. One. I think the zoo we would be covering was probably Twycross or Dudley Zoo, but... Um, mm-hmm. But so they, so you train those kind of people, would you? Um, it's more emergency training, um, use use of firearms in the event the lions escape, the tigers escape, that sort of thing. Oh. Um, the sort of sharp end of the training with the zoos and the parks. That all started um, because I was doing management work for zoos and wildlife parks. And after a while, one or two of them said, "Could you can you train our staff to do what you're doing? Um, levels of competency vary throughout the industry. And yeah, we, we, we started that off and then the, the police heard that we were doing that. Uh, one of the South, one of the, one of the Welsh constabularies had an issue with a, 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 a bull down at uh, Newport docks, I think it was, and then said, could I provide them with some training so that they could be clear that they were sort of best practice and due diligence yeah. covered. And so it's all sort of come around from that. 
it often amazes me when I sort of look, I look back and then consider the situation where it's just little on me. Well, Helen is the brains behind the organisation, my wife, but um, it, me doing what I'm doing, training at the level that we've been training, um, providing certificates to the shipping industry, Lloyds, yeah. the underwriters, um, zoos, wildlife parks, the police. Uh, and then I sort of look in the mirror and go, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I guess I guess we must be doing something right, but that, that's how it was born. Basically, I used to do a lot of it. Well, I and can, then people ask me how to do it. I can only speak as I find, and I remember a couple of years ago we had that media event in Hampshire, and that's when oh. we really got to know each other a lot better. Oh. That week, that week in the field, that um, quite a stressful week, but we had a fantastic week. And then you yeah. Yeah. kindly invited the Service UK team. Over to Wales, uh, I think it was the last um, last week in August, and we came on mass. I think it was fourteen or fifteen of us. Yeah. I didn't really know what to expect. A lot of the lads that helped me are anal about loading and long range shooting, and they were all really up for it. I was a bit nervous because I thought, "Oh God, they're all going to be looking at me." <laughs> and we had such a fantastic day, and we, everybody brought different guns, and yeah. we started on that in that quarry. Um, from that lovely setup you got, and um, and then, you know, you got that facility to take us back. Um, God, yeah. we were, I think we were shooting into Wales at one point. <laughs> it, it's a brilliant facility you've got there, and uh, just just tell us a bit more about it. Uh, it, it. The business when when I formalised the training part of what I was doing, um, I decided that I needed places for people to come to because I was doing 40,000 miles a year. <clears throat> and a lot of flights and a lot of traveling to go to people to train them and about 15 years ago the idea of offering it somewhere in in, in wales because we've got lots of open space came about initially it was a wonderful glacial valley up in the place near dinner's mouth we um then i set up all the facilities at the uh, sweet lamb rally center and started off the wms thing there we parted company there about eight uh, almost nine years ago now and switched over to the Elan Valley area where Helen and I, I decided we wanted to set our roots down. Um, great place, masses of space. Um, the business has sort of morphed through those three stages. Actually, the, the area that you saw is only about actually the sort of training area we have currently negotiated. We've got three separate training areas. Most people, to be fair, only get to the first one. Yeah. Um, we have a second area, which is more of a um, pro school thing for people who have visited a number of times and really want to test the level they've got to. Um, but it's not a place you take a you know first time visitor because it's, it's quite hard. Yeah. And a third area further up in the mountains where we were looking at developing the long, extreme long range target side of what we do. And to be honest, over the last couple of years, having got the third area sorted out, obviously the last 12 months has been interesting. We haven't, we haven't actually got up there much. But you've only seen a, a small part of, a, of yeah. what we've got. Lots of space. And the steel targets came about because making it an audio visual rewarding thing, like, you know, Pavlog's dog, the, 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 you know, yeah. the food turns into the click. I know. That visual image of the target moving and then the clang coming drifting back, it drives the whole process. I know. Totally different to punching holes in paper. I know. And we're trying to drive training and, and excellence. So. I know. I think these steel targets are fantastic and um, we've got them down at Froil and, um, you know, it, all my clients that turn up um, to start with us generally do the Basque test, the level one test, you know, uh, yeah. three, three shots, 100 metres into target. But, yeah. you know, if, if we've got some time in the day, we'll take them on the steel targets and they absolutely love it. But uh, yeah. but saying that with this lockdown, how have you managed then? I mean, it, I mean, I've it's, it's decimated my business for taking out clients. You know, it's been <laughs> just, <laughs> just coming into the Roebuck season last year. Um, yeah. Boom, lockdown, couldn't travel. Everybody cancelled the flights. All the deposits were re being returned. And uh, I managed during the rut in the summer to get out and um, with a, two or three clients that are, you know, British lads and stalk at a distance and um, did our cull of, you know, yearling cull books mm. and stuff like that, but no real trophies. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Freed us up into the autumn, started then, kind of thought we'd do well in the Faller book rut, but again, clients were just, you know, and, and, you know, acceptably very nervous about everything. So we haven't really done anything. So we've really, um, you know, relied on our social media and our content creation side of the business to help us. But 
What have you been doing? I've seen on social media you've been uh, championing the, championing the um, uh, non-lead ammunition. Tell us a bit about that. Um, two questions. First one, how have we been doing in lockdown? Uh, like everybody else, you know, and we're, we're very fortunate in that we basically don't owe money, so that, that's useful. Yeah. Um, we've trimmed back everything. Uh, similar to you, we get quite a lot of foreign clients coming um, up till February last year. It was heading for sort of 15 to 20 percent of our clients were coming from abroad to spend two or three days with us from all sorts of places, Germany, Austria, Kuwait, the United States, Canada, yeah. bizarrely, people coming from all over the place. Um, and obviously that that's all off. But the professional side of our work, work to recreation, we can't do. You can't travel for recreation, but actually work to work we can do. So the professional side of what we do has yeah. been going on for the last 12 months. Having said that, companies are very risk averse and actually some people who even you know could have come haven't. Yeah. So we've um, battened down the hatches, drawn in the belts, <laughs> and are looking forward to the bounce as, as it comes. People who have, you know, been booked with us have almost universally said, fine, we've got the booking, we'll do it when we can. People are now booking already, but we're, we're trying to delay things till after April. People are wanting to book because everybody wants a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but yeah, like everyone in the country, we, you know, we, we, we say we're fortunate in some and ways we, but we could both responsibly do it as well couldn't we you know it's like the same with stalking i mean i you know where you could you guys you could be set out at a distance from each other you're outdoors aren't you you know what i mean and, and as long as the weather was you know kind you could do that even under some restriction if they can just let us um you know meet people again um yeah. recreationally um which is you know be quite a few of your clients same with my clients. Yeah. We can through get the whole pandemic. We've actually through the whole pandemic, we've actually been fortunate. We're living in Caradigian. It's basically the safest, lowest coronavirus rate place in the UK. Coronavirus Europe. couldn't so, find you in Wales. Yeah. No, so, so, so in some cases, it's been Bring incredible. The post. <laughs> because we're being managed as if we're a city centre, but we're not. We're yeah, you know, we're we're the least populous part of Wales. Yeah. Um, Wales and England probably. So you know, there's that aspect to it. Um, but as I say, we, you know, chin up, <laughs> we're going forwards. You asked a question about the lead. I'm actually, it's bizarre. I'm in no way championing or suggesting or proposing any form of lead ban. I'm not anti-lead. We use plenty of ammunition with lead in it. Over the last 30 years, there's an increasing amount of choice of not lead stuff available the reasons that they started making the copper bullets was because they performed better than lead. They didn't lose weight. They penetrated better. They expanded more reliably. They didn't lose their jackets. It was actually to have better ammunition. After that, the science into lead, the, the lead ban from petrol, has led to a, a three to five point IQ rise in children being brought up in urban cities in Europe and America, terrifyingly. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We were all getting, you know, it was it, that that was happening. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, you know, we're talking about it in food and everything else. And what I've been trying to do is simply to highlight the fact that there's choices out there. And if for your own personal decisions or because your buyer doesn't want lead shot deer or maybe the government's going to turn around and ban it or Europe's going to ban it or the International Food Standards Agency is going to ban it. Knowing what's available, knowing what's out there is actually hugely useful for everybody. So yeah. this whole thing, oh, I'm going to want to lead ban. No, not at all. Yeah. I've made my own personal choices. I, you know, I, I, I was talking to some forest rangers over the last year who obviously six seven years ago was having to yeah they've their... moved to that completely haven't they i think the forest yeah. commission have you yeah. developed and, and a, a forest ranger said something really critical to me he said well now it's sorted out he said i spent the last three or four years really happy with the lead free ammunition that the forestry are using he and his associates in their area are culling thousands of deer a year he and his associates wouldn't want to go back to lead. And he said to me, Andrew, it, it really made me think because the clients buying venison from the Forestry Commission 
of buying lead-free venison. And I suddenly realized I'm, I'm a vocational stalker as well. Yeah. In my own rifle, I was using bullets with lead in them, doing my best with the carcasses as we all do, but yeah. potentially putting fragments of lead in burgers for my children and my grandchildren. Yeah. He really made me think, he said, and then he, he realized everything's working and he embraced the lead-free thing himself. And yeah. he says, now he's happy with all sides of the equation. There's no compulsion in that yet. No, I'm not well, the only lead, the only lead. Here it is, it, there's potential. Look at it because you may need it sooner than you think. That's it. Yeah, well, well, it's driven by people stipulating that you must lose. So if I go to Germany on a driven hunt and it's in state forests, it has to be lead free. So the only lead free I've used yeah. is Hornet GMX. And, yeah. um, and, and I, it's 150 grain. Uh, I was already using it. At, uh, this is the last three or four years mm. already using the SST was my go-to bullet and literally 150 grain uh, SST compared to the GMX. It's a centimeter apart. It drops into the same, you know what I mean? So you could literally travel abroad and not really have to re-zero uh, knowing that it did that. Now, when I started using it on my road deer, I did find the GMX was a little bit more aggressive uh, with regards to an exit hole, but it was still as, um, uh, you know acceptable and you know so it doesn't bother me either way but what does determine um, me using it is generally where I'm going to be using it uh, and at the moment I've got a good stock of lead but I, w I think in the future um, that's where I'll be going with it. I think I will go you know um, got like the commission has done I will go to just using um, lead free and I'll, I'll use whatever is available yeah, and, if they and, both shoot to the same point of aim, you've got the option to use the leaded stuff for practice if it's cheaper. Yeah. And then use the other stuff, for, you know, obviously check your zero, but use the yeah. other stuff for the hunting. Um, I, I, like you, have found that uh, there's various brands of lead free, um, there's various brands of lead we use. And in 308, there's a notable caliber, you know, one of the more common usual yeah. caliber. You can actually put five different rounds of ammunition in the magazine. And at 100 metres, you'll still put all the rounds in a beer mat. Yeah. I'm not suggesting you do that for stalking for a second. No, 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 yeah. People tell me that it's taken them years to find a group, uh, ammunition that groups well in their rifle. It's taken them years to find the only load they've got the confidence to shoot deer with. Yeah. Actually, all the, all the major ammunition manufacturers make bloody brilliant ammunition these days. Yeah. No, it's, it's, you're all, right. it's all more accurate than we are in the field. You can muck about on the bench all you like, but in the field, all the ammunition made is basically more accurate than we are once we're up on sticks, having to make a decision to make a shot quickly. Yeah. And now an increasing amount of it is available lead free. The ammo makers don't mind what we buy. No. Well, they make lead free and they make lead ammo. Yeah. So it's not like they care. Yeah, no, no, no. I, and it's, and with, um, you know, center fire rifles and shooting, you know, deer, large mammals and stuff. It, it, it does kill it. It's not like the wild fowling situation. And when we're goose shooting, when I back, when when we changed to um, steel um, years ago, when we were doing our sort of like uh, late summer um, Canada's coming in to, onto the stubbles, we really did see um, a difference in our ability to kill them with steel. You know what I mean? It wasn't a. It, it was just you know you really had to let them commit to the decoys and um i went up to scotland uh, in the autumn and we were shooting um pinks and um i took some lead up because you could inland uh, in scotland and and it was a blooming pleasure to shoot them dead it really was you know what i mean and um I, I, it kind of brought back memories of when we could use lead again it's going into your food so it's questionable but um it, it, it was just one of those things you know yeah there's, there's different equations on it um, and certainly the, the, the steel shot that we were using, the cartridges, sorry, with steel shot we were using in yeah. 10, 15 years ago, they're nowhere near as developed as the ones now. No. The copper thing started with a single company making a single product, the Barnes X Bullet. Now there's dozens of companies making hundreds of products. It isn't just copper. People talk about copper. There, there's zinc bullets available. Yeah. There's bullets available that fragment, that are lead-free. There's bullets available that... I've got a little board here. There's bullets available that... Well, hey. Stay looking like that. There's something I made earlier. <laughs> if, you look at the, if you look at the expansion of those... Yeah. You look at those. Yeah. Asking a humorous question, bearing in mind these are normally hitting animals between 2,000 and... 
2,800 feet per second. Yeah. Would you be bearing your ass to one of those at 200 meters or 100 uh, yeah, meters? Would you? Because actually, a lot of those were recovered from 200 meter. Um, you know. Really. Yeah. And. Uh, well, I yeah. I learned something. I was watching <laughs> one of your videos on field sports the other night, and I never realised the Barnes X. Call me stupid. You're stupid, Owen. Uh, the Barnes X is actually from the pattern that the bullet makes when it expands, because it's an X shape, isn't it? You know what I mean? Like, there you go. They're all Barnes X's. <laughs> Where is it? There's a, there, on my finger there, Yeah, that's an example of a, uh, a 150 grain Barnes X yeah. fired at fairly high velocity, and you can see the shape. Yeah. And uh, that one next to it, that one, yeah, was that one was, was sorry was recovered at, at two hundred meters two hundred and fifty meters sorry yeah that one was recovered at hundred meters so you can see the velocity makes a difference yeah. but then again it's the same with all sorts of other bullets yeah. anyway I'm sure anyway. everybody's fallen asleep us talking yeah. technical <laughs> so anyway let's talk about Andrew what's been your guilty pleasure during lockdown then Andrew what have you been up to have you uh, been eating plenty of venison that you harvested the previous year or what, what have you been up to I've, I've been fortunate I have been involved with a little bit of deer management during the course of lockdown on a work related basis yeah um, and you know we, we work testing ammunition firearms all sorts of stuff so uh, the freezers are far from empty we're, we're eating game, uh, pheasant, venison, whatever it is, um, probably three or four times a week at the moment. Wow. So, yeah, so, so you know, mm, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's going okay. Um, guilty pleasure. I, I bought a bicycle. I didn't just buy a bicycle because I discovered recently due to x-rays and uh, falling over on ice, because now that I'm over 60, I'm sitting over 62. You're never I, over I, 60. I, 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 don't, I don't fall over anymore. I have a fall. Yeah. So now, now that I'm really old, but I did, I fell over on black ice about a month ago, hurt myself. But prior to that, I'd hurt my knee. And I, I want Helen is getting into an, into a cycling. She's got a couple of proper bikes and I'm thinking I want to keep up with this, but how am I going to keep up? I got an e-bike. <laughs> brilliant. Aren't they? I've got an e-bike. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, I can, we, we live at the top, we live at about 1100 feet elevation at the top of the murderous hill, wherever you go from our house, it's basically downhill. Yep. And the e-bike, you've you, you, you got to pedal it to make it work. It doesn't just take me down the road. No, doing no. Nothing. Um, so my guilty secret is that I've been into the cycling thing. Um, unfortunately for the last uh, f almost four weeks since I had my crashing fall on ice, I've not been wanting to sit on a bicycle saddle very much. The reasons I won't go into in too much detail. No. But there's the guilty secret of an e-bike in the shed, which I'm looking forward well, to getting back onto. Not last summer. I've got lots of reloading. Not <laughs> last summer, the summer before, um, where we go for Shamwar, um, have become our very good friends. And we go to my mate Matthias at the Hotel Mitterhofer in Schladming. That could almost yep. be a plug. And uh, we went there for the summer. So you guys have got to come for the summer. And um, so me and the wife went over there and, um, and we had an absolutely fantastic time on these e-bikes. So we go out on them for the day. And when you'd probably do like, I don't know, 10, 15 kilometers on normal bike, we were going up mountains. It was, there was a turbo button and we were going past yeah. very fit people on bikes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we said, oh, we'll have to get some of these. And then we came back and found there were three grand each and decided yeah, we perhaps was, would leave it a little I while. Know much, but uh, but uh, uh, Helen has got the sporty bikes and I've got the e-bike. Yeah. Um, she's very concerned though, because actually, I, I, it's quite it's quite good i say off-road on forest tracks and stuff it's brilliant you know because you, yeah. you can cycle up a bloody mount, mountain with it um rough ground's no problem it's got suspension and stuff and i noticed online there was someone selling a little two-wheel trailer to go behind it and i've got this this weird sort of thing <laughs> going on in my head that uh if i get a little sort of uh, you know th you know folding rifle or something uh, something that goes in it. I've got this little trailer and you fit a roebuck in it. Absolutely lovely. And I've got this little fantasy in my head. I'm going to go cycling off silently into some permissive forest where I, you know, I've got, and yeah. I, and I'm, I, rather than, you know, draw it, I'm going to, I'm going to go st stalking with an e-bike. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I don't know if it'll come to anything. You've just <laughs> mentioned little rifle. So I've got to get a little plug in here. Oh, mate, I had a K5 given to me this year to use. And yeah. um, that little uh, a little 308 um, lightweight rifle, and I absolutely yeah. fell yeah. in love with it. It's it's not suitable 
for kind of you know eye volume culling like we do and i do like me you know modern rifle for that but this lovely yeah. little kick laugh, this lovely little mountain rifle mm. a year last autumn we took it to the alps um and um did a film and some um you know mm. product uh, promotion for it but i've so enjoyed using it and then in the summer this year because i didn't have clients i got to use this rifle and take it out for robux and i shot a couple of really nice robux myself with it and it was just it's just that single shot it's just so beautiful and it just it's got the most beautiful safety on it i really love it and uh, yeah so that's my little rifle you just plugged it up but my guilty pleasure <laughs> through the summer has been bass <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've discovered Bass Beer. I live near Burton on Trent. And uh, <laughs> when I was a lad, I used to work on the breweries for an electrical company. And uh, on one of the Facebook pages, a local Facebook page, somebody said, Oh, I was just selling bass at a pound a bottle. So I was going down there <laughs> and buying these packs because I normally would go to the pub at least once a week. I ended up drinking in my garden and drinking copious amounts of bass. <laughs> But my guilty pleasure for this last lockdown is my mate, Chef Pascal, who you know, uh, yeah, yeah. and I've enjoyed yeah. his, said to me, Owen, you need to get yourself a dehydrator. I said, a dehydrator? Yes, get yourself a food dehydrator. We can make this. I'll show you how to make this fantastic bill of tongue and that. So um, yeah. I um, invested in one of those. I think it was about 120, 130 quid. Yeah, uh, and yeah. it's a French one. It's actually sat next to me called BioChef. And um, what I've been doing with all this meat that we've been harvesting, and as you know, the the, uh, the venison prices have been absolutely yeah. horrendous, uh, which is a whole podcast on itself, isn't it? But um, so I've been stripping out the fillets, the tenderloins, and then the muscle groups on the on the legs, and uh, wow. dividing it all down. And then um, to Pascal's recipe, you're like um, uh, marinate it with herbs and stuff like that, then pickle yeah. it overnight in a in a vinegar, um, uh, Worcestershire sauce, honey um, solution for a couple yeah. of days, press it and hang it up. And I've been making this incredible, I think the Italians call it bresciola or something like that, but it's, it's, it's not like, it's not as dry as a bit of tongue. It's, it's got that little bit of giving. Oh my God. Yeah. And my, my, my youngest lad's just come back from London, um, well, about yeah. two, three weeks ago, um, and he's a, he's a real meat eater as it is, and I just can't keep him in it. <laughs> he eats two bits a night. <laughs> so yeah. um, this week we've been out in the woods and we've shot a few deer, so I'm going, I've got a, a, a nice um, uh, uh, roke, a uh, roke fallow calf that I'm going to um, put through the system and leave it a few days. And then uh, so that's a bit of a project coming up this weekend, but that's been kind of my second guilty yeah. pleasure, I think from uh, yeah, what I've been. I bought, I bought a sausage maker years ago and I've no, never got around to making a sausage. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, I'm quite blessed because my eldest lad, uh, well, and Dan as well, uh, Tom, he's a real foodie and he's got all, all those bits of kit and, when yeah. when we I tend to grab the um, you know the fillets and the haunches off it and then all the shoulders Tom has, and he minces yeah. it all up and backpacks it and everything and we get this back and we use it in our lasagnas and and stuff like that and it's it's delicious and we we've, we've really this year um, or well we're in February but um, mm. since the summer we've eaten a lot more venison and pheasants and stuff that we yeah. shot you know um, but uh, I've, I've noticed some very good publicity recently around venison. Oh, yeah, I, I've been seeing articles in the Guardian newspaper, yeah, really? which have been pro deer management, pro venison eating. Pro, it's like, how did that happen? You yeah. know, the, 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 it, it seemed there seems to be some sort of turnaround going on, yeah. and I think that, you know people are talking optimistically about the bounce effect. We've had a lot of thinking time during the course of the last year. Um, while justice have lost some of their more ridiculous legal battles, I can see a bit of a turnaround coming. It'll be up to us to follow through on it because field sports is notorious for being not great at its own PR. Yeah, we're very good at telling ourselves we're wonderful, but we're not very good at telling everybody else the the good we do. Yeah. But I, I can see a bit of a, a bit of a turnaround going on, and I'm thinking that if we can come out of this uh, a little more learned than we were. Um, and work out what people want and then supply it to them. Yeah. That's how the market works. It's, you yeah. know, well, demand has to come first, Definitely. followed by supply. 
people have not been shooting the deer numbers this year based on this pound and kilo that's been going around. And, you know, yeah. I've spoke to guys that are recreational stalkers and they've rang me and said, oh, what are you doing with your carcasses? And I said, well, I've got my own markets, really. And um, mm. and that's what I've had to, in the old days, you'd, you know, you'd shoot um, you shoot a, um, a chiller full of a deer and it would just be one phone call. The, the deer yep. um, game dealer would turn up, take everything away and you'd get a check, you know, probably a month later after you'd chased it. Um, but now yeah. they just don't want that. They don't want that quantity. The game dealers don't. They've got to keep yeah. dripping it through. They haven't got the restaurants. They haven't got the export. I'm, I'm sure Brexit's going to impact on that because they'll have to have export licenses for all the meat. So you, we've really got to start dealing with it. But I think we will see this year for definite deer populations going up, and um, because lads that are do, you know are doing doing a good job normally recreationally shooting them they've got freezers full just like i have as well you know freezers full and yeah. you know, the market isn't there and mm. um you know i, I was uh, talking to a guy the other day uh, who actually um shoots some rowing sort of like um yorkshire and he says yeah i'm having to give it away and i'm like give it away that's just you yeah. know it's... that's heavy talk in yorkshire i know i know i know so you have to pay <laughs> pay for his stalking lease yeah, pay yeah. to get there shoot the animal then give it away he's not even got any you know come back on you know to help him out with that so well, yeah it's difficult stuff but um it's we've got to remain positive I, like you said i think our businesses and i'm pretty um pretty positive in the fact that when we do come out of this and people have got the freedom but i mean i've got constantly got inquiries about shooting you know and people wanting to come for muntjac in the spring and i'm just mm. i'm just holding them off you know and say let's just see what happens you know but um you know, me and you can't be that far off getting our uh, vaccine, can we? Helen has been volunteering um, to help at one of the local vaccine clinics, which makes her an essential worker in some ways. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, she, despite being way younger than me, she keeps reminding me, yeah. um, she got her she got her jab a couple of days ago she was yeah. at the clinic there were some leftover people hadn't turned up they never want to waste them so they were asking the people helping out who hadn't had a vaccine yeah um and yeah she, she she's uh, had her so that's brilliant um, well, I, I, as the, I, I as the old bloke are limping on <laughs> yeah without our podcast heading in the direction of coronavirus and all that but i heard a similar story um whereas uh, i think it was at stafford they were getting a no-show of something like 30%. And this was on the first virus. And they yeah. could use it in a day, else they have to throw it away. And uh, mm. and a local business, um, I won't say the name, but a local business picked up on this and they contacted them and they just dribbled staff down there of all ages yeah. just so they got it. And they virtually got 150 people done in a yeah. week yeah. because just yeah. to stop the, um, you know, the, the Pfizer, it's the Pfizer jab that's the one that has to be kept at a very cold temperature. Yeah has to be used straight away and yes yeah, so, yeah. but i mean we're doing really you know we haven't we've had a nightmare with coronavirus as a country and um and again that could be a whole podcast on itself but you know the we can't draw some positive from the the vaccinations is absolutely flying isn't it so um hopefully we see our freedom late spring and um we have a normal summer and um, yeah. yeah that's what i'm hoping for but uh, anyway well, if I no. can just stop falling over and as i mentioned before the podcast if i can stop falling over not fall off the bike and not hit myself on the head with the crowbar again there's a yeah. little how have you done that what have you done well i was I, I, <laughs> we're getting into we've got i put gray partridges out locally for a couple of years without the intention of shooting any to try and get them to start breeding again in the no. area the i remember you telling me about that yeah, yeah. and um i obviously pest, pest control is a big thing you know uh, we heavy on the crows and that sort of thing uh, but we've had extraordinarily cold weather um, and I've been trying to go out even though I haven't actually felt 100% over the last month and you know how cold the weather is now and I'm yeah. like I'm standing around outside or I'm sitting there in a bloody you know Polaris with, with, with a roof but nothing else on it so I decided to make myself a fox box being, yeah. being, a, being, a, being a sort of impecunious type of person yeah. I found a load of old pallets and I've that's the one I can line the inside with some old carpet. I'm going to get some plastic sheets to put on the roof on the outside. So within a, within a day or two, I hope I'm going to have my Fox box with a, a cup holder. I've got a, um, I've got an electric heated waistcoat. Oh, you're laughing. <laughs> We've got the same. We've got dough boxes as are, um, not specific, yeah. 
this specifically for foxes, but uh, yeah. we've done the same with lined and with the old Axminster and stuff. But I can tell you, we've had all kinds of things nesting in there. We've had uh, one of the ones in the cotsholes, we had uh, blue tits in it in the spring, and I forbid yeah. anybody from going in there. And they were coming up through the door, and they're just in the corner where you opened the door was yeah. this beautiful ball of <laughs> blue tits nest. We've had um, wasp nests, we've had bees, we've had bats, we've had yeah. everything in ours. But yeah. uh, are they? For the winter, they're awesome. And just to sit there on a um, cold, windy afternoon, uh, you know, in the winter, yeah, they're, they're a great they're a great asset to uh, whether yeah. it's foxes you're managing or deer or whatever. Well, we have, we're still relatively deer free in this part of Wales. I've got to probably drive 40 or 50 miles to have a, a reasonable chance of deer stalking still. Yeah. Um, you know, we're in the Eland Valley sort of area, the, the white wilderness of mid Wales. The partridge project's going all right. Actually, we, we, we've got partridges around from two years ago. We've got last year's partridges still around. Yeah. They're now in the next month. They'll be starting to sort of split up and pair up and disappear around. But yeah. in the meantime, we've got to keep on top of the old uh, predator control side. And it, again, it's, it's, it's something else to do. Keep busy. We're imagining that um, after Easter, I know Easter's a bit early this year, but we're really thinking that sort of April into May is going to be are likely opening up in terms of UK to UK stuff. Yeah. I don't think international travel is really going to get back into anything notable for a while. No. I wouldn't like to specify how long a while no, that would I'm, be. I'm the same. I've not took any bookings for, I'm, I'm, I'm taking bookings for the rut, you know, in July, mm. August. Uh, mm. and, and last year we actually shot, um, you know, probably a dozen books in September, which is normally my calls done, my yeah. trophies are shot, and we're, we're only yeah. looking at fallow deer on stubbles. But last year it was, um, and you know, that when you start to shoot them books in the autumn, you get these incredible trophy heads, you know what I mean? These, yeah. these uh, yeah. beautiful colours where they've gone the whole uh, the whole season and they're nice and dark, but the tips are absolutely like ivory, you know. But uh, no, That's right, that's right. I think you'll be having the same again this year. Huh? Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I'm, I've, I've got at least two books that should have gone last year, so they'll be really old. So it'll be interesting to see. We've got some good books showing in Velvet, but we always, <laughs> even me, who's been looking at row books for 30 years, I don't know if I get excited when I see them in Velvet. And like, <laughs> it's big and they clean off and they go, Shoo. I know, if they're, they're in Velvet and they're running up above the ears and you're thinking, yeah. oh my God, you know, it's going to go like that. But, uh... but well, it's yeah. been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and I really appreciate you being our first test podcast and um, <laughs> having a catch up like we have. Um, on my podcast the other day I did with this guy, his final question was, what is hunting to you? So that's just, you know, you do this job, you love going out. What is it to you? How would you define it? The immediate answer that came into my head, which that's is a slightly historical one, um, is uh, hunting's my life. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, I don't, I don't mean any, that's not in any way disparaging to anybody or any else or any other activity I'm involved with. Yeah. I've animals, the natural world, whether it was the work I used to do with zoos and wildlife parks or wildlife charities, keeping things in, psychological barriers, electric fencing, keeping things out. My initial qualification in life was agriculture. The whole animal, livestock, natural thing has, has I've made it my life. Um, what I have learned, and I'm still learning every day, what I've learned over that sort of chunk of my life, probably almost almost 40 years, actually 35 years, certainly, um, of variously doing it, whether it started off as pest control, well, it started off as leisure and, and pleasure and sport, yeah. then moved into pest control, and then the larger subject to wildlife management. It's so much part of um, me and everything I do and a lot of the people I know. Yeah, the first thing that popped into my hat, it it, it's my life. Actually, I've got clients who have done far more proper, what I call international hunting than I have. Yeah. Um, I've been very fortunate. I've been to some wonderful places and, and, and you know, done some wonderful stuff. But I've, I've, got, I've got clients who have been to 30 or 40 different countries yeah. on different stuff. I remember an interesting conversation in, in the States with um, Colonel uh, Craig Boddington, who's a well-known American gun writer. I know him. He's and written a number of books on the subject. And it was after he'd, he'd actually released a book. This would be back in about uh, 2003 to maybe something 2004. Um, I was over at some uh, doing some safari club shows and that sort of thing over in America. And I was talking to Craig in his office and uh, we're having a good old chat. 
and he'd written this book and I was holding it in my hand. I had like first edition in my hand. And, and I said, ah, you know, great. He says, there's this much experience out on paper. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, I, man, I, I've been hunting all my life, Andrew. Yeah, you've got to realise that I've, uh, well, I, I, I think I've taken maybe 300 head of big game. And what he meant was a bear, elk, deer, the animals he'd hunted abroad, probably 40, 50 animals abroad, whether it was yeah. a leopard or a buffalo. Yeah. But we forget that American hunters have to queue for 10 years to get an elk tag sometimes. Yeah. They might be hunting a couple of three deer a year. They've got to get tags for squirrels. But I stood there in a sort of, you know, I don't know, modest sort of Welsh British boy mode and thought, you've taken three or maybe 400 head of animals bigger than a roe deer down. And at the time, I was in the heyday of doing the management work I used to do with the zoos and the wildlife parks. And that, I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> why, why haven't I written a book? Well, I haven't written a book, but actually um, it really brought home on me, to me that you've actually, thank you, I've been bought a cup of, uh, I've been bought a cup of tea in a oh. company. <laughs> um, it really brought home to me that uh, you know proper proper sort of I, I, I called you a silverback once yeah. um not just because of the hairs on your back um we're in a generation where you, you've done a bit of hunting yeah i've done a bit of hunting i've got clients who have done even more hunting i'm helping them i'm training them i'm learning from them at the same time and we're getting into a generation where i could be sitting here and saying yeah um everything i've ever learned about hunting I learned off someone called Daniel, who's a 21 year old on TikTok with a Creedmoor. Actually, in this world of social media, and no offense to anyone called Daniel, no, no. in this world of social media and everything that we Silverbacks find ourselves in, yeah. we're, like a, we're like a forgotten secret in some ways. I don't know. Because there's a whole, there's, gen, there's two generations now probably well, who actually think that the 21 year old on TikTok. Yeah. because they have got 2 million followers and they do the expert. Put, put, put post up a day, yeah. actually know everything. Yeah, I know they know a lot. I know they know something, but time served, yeah. an apprenticeship and time served still mean something. And we forget that. We shouldn't forget that. Yeah. And I always think, you know, I've shot a lot, but then I get to meet these old gillies in Scotland or the old, you know, the old retired oh, yeah. forestry lads, um, you know, and, when, and you hear what they did and what they've done and, you know, the, the travels that they've done through the jobs and what they've shot. But you're just saying, Craig Boddington, he, he hunted with me, oh, must be six or seven years ago, yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as, as part of a media event that we organised. And uh, I, was, I wasn't, I I'd, I'd sorted out which guide was doing what. And I'd, I'll be honest with you, I kind of knew him, but I didn't know him i didn't know what he'd done but anyway he was such a character um in the he camp that was he was just him. awesome guy and i thought oh i'll take him out one night yeah. and i was after a good roebuck and i got this one meadow where we got a, um a, a, a tower mm. looking over it sat up it with him and um uh, nothing happened it was just my blooming look okay. out come this cool buck across the field uh yeah. i give it a couple of feeps and he comes screaming across and he stopped and he you know the, he must have been entering this bigger book's territory and he was not. It's like a sheet of glass. He wasn't going to go yeah. any further. And he said, just give me a minute there, boy. And he got down. <laughs> he said, just tell me the distance. And I went, 280? <laughs> I said, I'm trying to get it a bit nearer, Craig. He said, no, I'll be good with that. I'm like, what? And he's like, sock. And he kind of almost shot it off. It was not how you would expect. And he shot it absolutely perfectly. I was mega impressed. Mega impressed. I hope he gets to hear this because I was like, bloody hell, that was one hell of a shot. It took us 10 minutes to walk to it. But he was a really good guy, really good company to have yeah. out the yeah. place. And um, yeah, he was he, he, he came with all the honor team and it was just a really good time. But again, um, I then started following what he did and saw what he did and what oh. a bastard he is in the States for all what he did. But uh, anyway, that was my great. One point. of the things that separates him from a lot of people is that he practices and prepares for everything he does to an extraordinary degree. His military background has not yep. been lost on him at all. He plans, he practices, he prepares by the time he gets there, he knows he knows about the subject. Yeah. And 
one of the reasons I do what I do, I didn't go down the route of staying in the gun trade or I didn't go down the route of staying working with diner hunting tours, selling safaris and things. Yeah. Is actually I worked out that talking to guides all around the world, the main missing link wasn't the ammunition supply, the gun supply. It wasn't the, you know, the ability to, you know, go hunting in wonderful places. It was training and preparation for what people do. You can talk to any professional hunter, any guide, any, anywhere in the world around the campfire, and you say, what would you change about your job? And they, they generally, apart from bureaucracy and legislation and all the rest of it, they'll say, I wish the clients could shoot. Yeah. <laughs> and you, know, yeah. you gave that as a shining example. Yeah. He's someone who pr he probably fires a couple of hundred rounds down range for every single round he fires at a live animal. Yeah. I know a lot of people who get through 40 rounds of ammunition a year and they fire 23 of them at deer or foxes yeah. and they fire the rest checking zeroing. Yeah. They haven't actually practiced their shooting no. on, on, on non-living quarry on targets or whatever yeah. at any stage in it. People tend to practice on a bench with a bipod and a back bag and they shoot a little group and then they wander off into a wood somewhere with sticks. Yeah. With, with all the practice I do, I've got a little ritual when, when I when I get out of my vehicle and I'm in the car park, wherever it is, you know, at your place. Yeah. I stand by the vehicle for about five or ten minutes before I walk anywhere just to let the world settle down around me. And while I'm doing that, I'll practice dry firing off the sticks. Yep. I'll check everything around me is OK. Yep. I'll make sure the scope's set on low magnification. I'll do all the sort of normal prep things. But I've got this ritual I always dry fire and just do a bit of more preparation. I, I've got too many rifles. Like, okay, so I'm on that rifle. That's the trigger. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. It's this preparation thing. And it's, it's the main missing link. If people are shooting at living quarry, it's shooting something with a pulse. You should be firing dozens, if not twenties or fifties of rounds. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be expensive ammo. It can be any yeah, old no. practice ammo, or you can use an air gun or a two, two rifle, but practice the positions standing sitting kneeling off sticks you know whatever it is do yeah. it with an air gun do it with a 2-2 dry fire with your other rifle yeah that's how guys like craig pull off shots like that i know it's just, there's, there's only one other guy that's that's come along and shot almost in a military way and he was a danish guy um yeah. it was military again um who just and he was using my sow. I mean, this is 20 years ago. And he zeroed, he shot it better than me, my own rifle. You know what I mean? He was like, like I said, do it. So I got one of these back home, you know, um, uh, he's had a Danish accent, not an American accent, but anyway, <laughs> but you know, he's, uh, but he was though, I can remember that Craig Bonington and the guy that, um, that, that came and shot, he was, uh, they were very, like you say, and I think it just purely comes from training, you know, but uh, great it's advice. That I had a very um, um, life-affirming, forming experience. In about 2003, I, I met up with some friends in the States, and we went to Gunsight in Arizona, which is Colonel Jeff Cooper's training ground. We spent, I think, I think three days there. And um, it was extraordinary. You, you were straight on to shooting steel targets. At the time, I wasn't aware of anyone really shooting steel targets in the UK. I wasn't, you know... A, I, I, I hadn't since I was a cadet at school doing plate runs. I hadn't shot steel targets. Um, that was we were training targets. We were doing things differently. <laughs> Everything was more field orientated. If they wanted you to fire five shots at a target, they made you put two rounds in your pocket so that you had to do a quick field reload and yep. get used to the handling. Obviously, I mean, we did work with pistols and rifles you know, together, but it was a really formative experience. And I came back to the UK and I thought, right, I'll buy some of these steel targets. I was making them. I found a company in Birmingham to make some for me. And we started off with the steel target thing. And I thought it was such a lot of fun. We, we found this valley up near Dinner's Mouth. We had in the back of beyond the North Wales. And I put the targets in a rucksack when I had a good knee, probably how I did my knee. Yeah. Um, and I went out onto this hill and I put these targets out and put an ad in a, in a, in a, you know in the magazine at the time which i think was sporting rifle yeah um and people started coming and it's really interesting that going to gun site having that formative experience and that's the sort of place that craig goes to do his training yeah yeah um and then coming back starting to make steel and 
Look, look at it now. Yeah, I know. I know. There's a, there's a dozen companies making steel targets or more. I know. There's now there's loads of great facilities where you can go to shoot. Yeah, I've got friends who phone me up and they say, "Oh, Andrew, you, um, got bad news for you." Oh no, what is it? You know, yeah. Oh, there's there's someone started up another range with steel targets in Yorkshire or Cumbria or or, or, yeah. or Berkshire, and I go, "That's great." And they go, "What do you mean it's great? It's competition." They go, "No, it's great. Yeah. It, it's increasing the marketplace. It's increasing the availability Absolutely. for proper training, for practice. All training's good." Yeah. Even if it only serves the purpose of you realizing you don't like that particular trainer and the way they do stuff. Yeah. Something like that. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, all all, all training is good. And the bigger we make the marketplace, and most critically, the more welcoming we are to people who don't look like us. Yeah. The shooting community is shooting itself in the foot because we stand around and someone turns up in a tracksuit with alarmingly colored trainers on. Yeah. And we're like, who are you? Um, yeah, okay, we are an oppressed species and we are, a pre you know, we, we receive yeah. a lot of prejudice in life. We're the last people you can be really horrible to and get away with it. Um, but we've got to be more welcoming and having more facilities, more places to shoot, more people doing it yeah. to the standard, which is good. How do we set standards? That's a, that's a, a whole other podcast. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, we got How do we set standards? Um, but no, it, it, it's great that the, the whole thing has grown like Topsy. Um, there's all sorts of people now doing all sorts of rifle shooting. A lot of it is is led by the hunting side of it. The target shooting side of it um, is still a bit club orientated. I think that that's yeah. okay, but it's hard to get into clubs. And once you've got in there, scary because it's sort of male, pale, and stale atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. We need to be more diverse. Yeah, I can't help it. I'm a sixty year old. 62 yeah. year old well, like right. i said when we came to your, we can welcome yeah. anyone who isn't like us we came to your facility we had a fantastic time and like you say that we've got to <laughs> we've got to really um promote our sport and get more people coming along and shooting right yeah. i mean you know i used to help at a local shooting ground years and years ago just with you know corporate clay pigeon shooting and i used to love doing yeah. that people used to turn up you know fire a shotgun for the first time and um mm -hmm. you know that was well back in the late eighties when um, everybody was trying to do, you know, all the yuppies were doing clay shooting and stuff like that, but it was, it was great. Yeah. And, and I still know people that started there and are now, you know, seasoned game shooters, but uh, anyway. Clay, clay, clay shooting in the sort of, in sort of 2000 to maybe 2010, it, it became the new golf, you know, like the, with improvement yeah. places like the Royal Berkshire shooting school. Um, it became the new golf. And actually the fallout of that is a lot of people who are into game shooting are now thinking, oh, deer stalking, yeah. rifle shooting, that's another thing. So it is growing, certificate numbers are going yeah. up. But we, as I say, we need, to, we need to have the standards, we need to set and encourage the right standards. We need the facilities, lots of facilities done and run safely. Yeah. Hopefully sane people. Um, and then we need a market for what we shoot. Well, we, you're just saying that. I was just thinking what you were saying. I, I mean, we do a thing called a deer stalking experience, which is like three outings. And I would say the general stereotypical British guy is a ex game shooter, or not ex game shooter, a game shooter that wants to do some, get into a little bit of deer stalking and he'll turn up and, you know, he hasn't got a, a firearms ticket but he'll do like a day with us and we start mm. him off on the range and talking through the calibers and tell him about whatever vicinity we're in, what the deer is and the reason why we're managing them and stuff like that. But that's the guy that comes to us. He's generally a guy that's shot a lot of pheasants and, and he's looking yeah. to be out in the countryside and do something a little bit different. And um, I think one the the favourite or the most common thing said is when they're sat, sitting up the eye seat is, God, blimey. And you go, well, that's a, that's a green woodpecker, that is. And you know, you put, point out a few birds where as, as you sort of like yeah. um, absorb into nature in an eye seat and you just start to, you know, bit of dusk and it, you start to get that um, change of shift of wildlife and they don't eat with yeah. the pheasant shooting they don't get to see that you know what I mean and and they, they really love being yeah. outside yeah. and then they get to see you know what else is in the woodland and um, side shoot to this whole communion with nature thing because uh, some of those who would do us down see us being a, as an unnatural thing yet their favorite animals are wolves killer whales yeah lion, their favorite birds are eagles and peregrine falcons but they don't like people who hunt. Uh, yeah. Really weirdly, 
we tend to say the guy who's come from the game shooting thing, that the, the bloke who wants to get in the shooting. A, the vast majority of the quickest learners and the best shots we receive as a business are not guys at all. No, I'm the same with them. They're, they're, they're women type people. Yeah, I know. Um, and, and, and actually, no ego, you know, non gender aligned, whatever you want to be these days, but you know, whatever. You don't have to be a man or a woman. Um, but the other interesting thing is, I'm aware of some remarkable things happening with vegans who won't eat farmed meat, who will not do anything to support what they see as the intensive meat industry, you know, factory chickens, whatever. But they need their vitamin B12 fix. They increasingly will eat hunted meat. Yeah. We okay. We can market what we do to people who read the Shooting Gazette or something. Yeah. But imagine if we marketed what we were doing as natural, stress-free, naturally harvested meat. Yeah. Sustainable. To help who want a vegan lifestyle but realise that for their kids and for them eating some meat sometimes is actually a healthy thing, but they don't want to eat farm meat. We're missing lots of links. Um, I shouldn't have said links, should I really? Uh, we're missing, we're <laughs> That's a missing new podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's another podcast. Um, the potential for us is absolutely huge, but we've got to kind of broaden our horizons. Yes. We've got to stop feeling like an oppressed minority. Yeah. Less than 1.5% of the European or British population hunts. Yeah. The other 98.5% all vote. Mm. If we can't find ways of being more popular and appealing to the mass population, and our enemies are better at PR than we are, we do face extinction. Yeah. But I'm an optimist, and I don't believe that'll be the case. Yeah. But we have to wake up if the marketplace would happily embrace what we shot, if they understood it, if they didn't think there was any faint chance it could poison them, yeah. right? and they understand that we're doing it all in the best possible way with conservation at the forefront of everything we do, with yeah. it being sustainable, every hunter in the world I know wants their children or their grandchildren or their friends' children to be able to do what they do because we love and know what we do yeah and there's a whole future in that yeah you know yeah we we, yeah. we we care factory farming may actually not care quite as much industry may not care the shareholders of a big corporation may not care because they're only responsible sorry the, the the people who run companies are responsible to the shareholders yeah we've seen a recent political turnaround where an interesting report has proposed to, to boris johnson and the current uk government that they should set sustainability and environmentally successful criteria as another a new layer of the definition of success and desirability in a business it isn't can't be just about making money yeah. we could be part of that but you know we just have to broaden our minds and get out there and do it yeah i know well, it's been a <laughs> pleasure speaking to you. I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the catch up that we've had. And um, if these podcasts are successful, I will definitely be asking you back. So I hope you've enjoyed it. It's a bit of a trial. Um, it's just like chatting, really, isn't it? <laughs> um, and um, I've, as ever, always come away from you having learned something. And uh, I want you to send my regards to Helena. And as soon as we've got this lockdown out of the way, and uh, we got a bit more sunlight. I'll be over there to enjoy myself and uh, I'll get you over in the summer for some Robux. Brilliant. The next time we chat, I can uh, I can talk to you about what I'm doing next week, which I cunningly Ooh. haven't mentioned now, but <laughs> will, be, will be of great interest to you. Being so, dropped into Angola. Yeah. Anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure, Andrew. Uh, stay safe, yeah. keep healthy, and uh, I wish you all the best for the future. Uh, and let's stay in touch. And uh, I'll see Brilliant. you soon.